Okay. Let's start. Okay, let's start, please. So before we move to uh, more randomized algorithms, I hope you enjoyed the Dolby lecture. The sum that you saw, even though it was written from minus infinity to infinity in a kind of signal processing paradigm, you can think of it that you take samples so you want to simulate how a big room sounds uh, on your headphones, right? So what you do is the following. So you take one stream of data, which is the samples of the sound that you want it to be reproduced, sampled sufficiently frequently, namely at least twice the highest harmonic, right? Now the second stream, and the samples become the coefficient of your polynomial, you take samples, say, within a finite window of, say, 1,024 uh, samples uh, long. Then what you do the following. How do you get the filter that will simulate the room? Essentially, what you do is you put a microphone uh, in the room, and then you deliver. It's not exactly how it is done, but theoretically, this is what it is, and then you emit a very brief, uh, sharp spike. And then you listen how the room responds, uh, what you hear with all of the reflections, right? And the samples of that sound, uh, right, that you take a finite piece of them, as Mike said, uh, the response will decay after a certain number of samples, there will be anything hardly left. So now, to get any kind of music inside uh, uh, in your headphones to sound as if it was played in a, say, large concert hall, is you take the one polynomial whose coefficients are the samples of the sound, and another polynomial whose coefficients are the samples of the impulse response of the room, right? This response to a single blip, right? and then you multiply these two polynomials, uh, the coefficients of the product polynomial uh, is what you play inside your headphones to get the feel as if the music is being played uh, in a, a large, for example, concert hall or in a, any particular concert hall, uh, right? So the convolution, the coefficients of the product polynomial we said this is the convolution of the coefficients of the two polynomials. In this case, it's a convolution of the samples of the sound you want to hear and uh, samples of the impulse response of the room, right? And uh, what Mike then showed that if you did it by brute force, it would take 96 megaflops uh, to compute uh, the coefficients of this product polynomial, and it takes only four megaflops uh, uh, if you use FFT, because uh, rather than having it quadratic, you have it run, running in time n log n. So you can see how hugely important uh, FFT is for uh, signal processing. Okay, so um, that is... Uh, and they really have extremely good internships. I had several former students uh, in algorithms class uh, uh, getting this internship, and they had extremely good experience learning a lot of interesting stuff there. And some of them actually became permanent employees. So I always invite them every year so that they show you that FFT is really, really amazingly useful stuff and allows you it's much better to do an internship at Dolby than in a bank, trust me, right? <laughs> so you get much more cool stuff, uh, learning uh, cool stuff there. Okay, so back to randomized algorithms. So what we are going to see next uh, is something called uh, perfect hashing. And uh, an interesting feature of it is that uh, 
the data structure, namely the hash table and hash function that we will produce, is not randomized at all. It's a fully <coughs> deterministic uh, um, structure. However, the method to produce the hash, uh, the hash function and the hash table, right, is a randomized method of trial and error, right? Now, in order for a trial and error to be a reasonable um, strategy to produce something, you have to have a guarantee that the number of consecutive failures uh, is uh, expected number of failures is small. So that within a few trials you will get what you want. Right? So the, uh, hash, uh, the hashing that we are going to show is fully deterministic. The hash function will be fully deterministic. But the method of producing it, uh, of choosing parameters to, uh, to get it to work as it should, uh, is uh, randomized. So this will be a static hash table. This is essentially a lookup table, right? Um, for example, if you are building a compiler, then uh, it's, a, it's essentially any kind of lookup table, and the point is that the table has to be completely collision-free, right? And the hash function has to be extremely easy to calculate, fast to calculate, right? So how do we go about that? Uh, so we want the table to be of reasonable size, namely to be a small multiple of n, of the number of keys that you want uh, stored, okay? And uh, it should be completely collision-free, and as I mentioned, the hash function should be very efficient to compute. So let's see how we go about it. The main ingredient uh, for this construction is something that is actually used uh, in huge number of uh, randomized algorithms and not only um, uh, algorithms, it's an extremely important uh, mathematical theorem called the Markov inequality. So what does Markov inequality say? Uh, essentially, Markov inequality allows you to estimate uh, if you have a uh, non-negative, so this should be actually x bigger or equal than zero, not uh, uh, strictly bigger than zero. So if you have a non-negative random variable, and if you know an estimate of its expected value, so average value, you want to figure out how likely this random variable is uh, to achieve values that are much larger, that are large, right? So somehow uh, the expected value should be able uh, to tell you how likely it is uh, that the, the uh, random variable will achieve certain large values. Uh, more precisely, uh, you take a positive number t, and then you have the following estimate. So remember, x is a non-negative uh, random variable. So Markov inequality says uh, probability that this random variable will have large values, uh, namely uh, a large value x bigger than this uh, value t, is smaller than the expected value divided by t. So as t grows, uh, you can see the probability to hit large values uh, decreases. Uh, and uh, decreases exactly as a uh, reciprocal of t. So what, wh why is this useful? It is useful because you, it allows you to trade. If you want to see how uh, likely it is, for example, that your hash table has large number of collisions. Uh, all you have to do is uh, to find the average number of collisions uh, and then probability to have, say, more than five collisions 
will be smaller, not larger than the average number of collisions divided by five. Right, so you can get information about likelihood of certain events from the uh, average value of the random variable. And this is extremely easy to prove, uh, um, for example, for discrete uh, random variable, the expected value of a random variable, how do we define it? Well, it's a sum of the products of all possible values of the random variable, discrete random variable, times the probability for x to hit that uh, uh, value. So it's sum of probability that x is equal to v times uh, v, right? Now the trick is, uh, uh, rather than summing over all values v, summing over all values v because x is non-negative, right? This will be always larger than if you sum only uh, over the values that are bigger than your constant t, right? But uh, if v is bigger than t, then this product will be certainly larger than probability times t, right? Because v is only bigger or equal than t. And now t can go outside and voila, you just get uh, that the expected value is larger than t times probability that x is bigger than or equal than t. And when you divide by t, you get precisely the Markov inequality. So it's easy to remember Markov inequality simply allows you to estimate how likely your random variable will, uh, how likely is it that your random variable will have a large value, say, value bigger than a thousand, well, it is smaller than the expected, the average value of your variable, random variable, divided by a thousand. So it's presumably a small number. Yes? Can the system model trace the by integration? Okay, so this is, that's a very good question. Can we replace sigma by integration? Yes. So if you replace consistently everywhere a discrete summation by integration, you get this precisely the same statement true for continuous uh, uh, random variables, right? When P is uh, replaced by the probability density. So yes, exactly the same proof. Uh, you can just rewrite it replacing discrete summation by integration of the density. Okay, so how do we go now about designing a perfect hash table that is uh, very fast to, with hash function that is fast to compute? So as I mentioned, it will be a trial and error uh, procedure with low probability of many consecutive failures. And we do it in two steps, right? The first step is uh, uh, we are going to solve a simpler problem and then use it to achieve the sharper result. Uh, you, we will be constructing table of size less than two times n squared, where n is the number of keys to be hashed into the table. And we do that using universal hashing, right? Uh, and we will have that probability so simply, you will uh, use uh, uh, universal hashing uh, to randomly choose uh, the parameters for the scalar product that in, is involved in the universal hashing, you remember. And um, we simply um, uh, uh, then look whether such a table is collision free or not. And we do, we repeat uh, this random choice of the parameter. Uh, you, you remember this random vector. Um, we repeat it until we get uh, a collision free hash table. Now, why does this make sense? Well, probability that such a table, randomly chosen uh, hash table, will be uh, collision free is larger than one half, right? So, um, how do we uh, uh, get such a hash table? As uh, usual, uh, what we had before, 
when we were doing universal caching, you choose your, uh, um, your m, the size of the hash table, to be the least prime that is larger than n squared, okay? So we know that between any number and twice that number, there is a prime number. So this number m will be strictly smaller than uh, 2n squared, right? So once you choose the size of the, uh, of the hash table, then you pick a random vector A and you hash all the keys using the corresponding hash function, right? You remember how the hash function operates. It, you take any key, you represent it in a basis M, where M is the size of the hash table. You get the digits in basis M. They are coordinates of the corresponding vector of size R, for example. <coughs> Then you pick an arbitrary uh, R tuple uh, of uh, numbers that are between 0 and M, just using a random number generator. And then the value of the hash function is a scalar product between vector X and vector A modded out by M, right? So uh, this is the hash function that we use. So now we want to estimate uh, uh, how likely it is uh, that we will hit a completely collision-free hash table? Well, if you have n keys, uh, then there are altogether n over two pairs of keys, uh, right? Now, you, you remember we proved that uh, um, when we pick at random hash functions from a universal family, probability that any two elements collide is one over the size of the table, right? Now you have n over two pairs of keys for each key, the probability to collide is one over m, but we know that m is bigger than n squared, so the one over m will be smaller than one over n squared. So then the expected total number of collisions, right, will be the number of pairs, um, times the probability of a collision for each pair, right? Which is uh, smaller or equal when you write n over 2 uh, as n, n minus 1 divided by 2. Uh, this will be smaller because n is larger than n squared. You get that this is smaller than n minus 1 over 2 times 1 over n squared and what is on the top is strictly smaller than n squared, so you get uh, that the expected dot number of collisions is uh, less than one half. But we now want to trade this uh, for, to estimate the probability that we have at least one collision. Well, this is where Markov gets into the play, right? Um, we have that probability that the random variable is bigger than one is smaller than the expected value of x divided by one, because t is equal to one. And we just saw that the expected value of x is smaller than one half. So with probability smaller than one half, you will have at least one collision. So with probability larger than one half, the table will be collision free. So how do you go about uh, obtaining such a table? You simply keep picking the hash functions, namely these random vectors, just at random. Each time the probability to fail is less than one half, probability to fail 10 times in a row is smaller than one half to the power 10, which is very small. And in fact, we can estimate the expected number of trials, right? Um, what is the expected number of trials? Well, a single trial will be just one times probability for success, which is one minus p. Remember, p is a probability of failure is smaller than one half. Plus two uh, times uh, two trials, 
one uh, probability of failure is one minus p, probability of success is p, and so forth, and you uh, recognize this uh, uh, sum, we already had it, this is a uh, triangular sum that sums up to one over p, uh, one minus, one over one minus p squared, this is the same uh, computation that we already um, had. So the, uh, pro the expected value is one over one minus p. Because p probability of failure is less than one half, then the expected number of uh, 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 trials uh, is uh, less than two, right? Because it's less than one over one minus one half, so that's two. So this means that on average, it will take you only two trials to produce a hash table of size smaller than 2n squared that is perfectly collision free, right? Now what we have to do is somehow reduce this 2n squared because n squared is very large, right? This is a gigantic, uh, a hash table to be populated only with n many keys, right? So um, we now have to um, somehow reduce this to a linear function of, uh, of n. So how do we do that? Again, the same trick. So you remember we chose a small m to be um, larger than um, n squared but smaller than 2n squared. Now we choose m to be larger than n but smaller than 2n, right? So this time uh, linear. Uh, and we do the following. Uh, we construct a, uh, uh, using a perfect hashing, we construct a um, hash table of size capital M, right? Um, and we now compute, uh, we now look how many collisions uh, there are in uh, uh, this table, right? Well, so let's say that slot I of this uh, randomly generated uh, hash table of size M has uh, Ni many elements, uh, right? Uh, so the trick will be now to, this will be a two-level hashing. The uh, first layer hash table, when you hash the number, in the, uh, if it goes into the i-th slot, in the i-th slot you don't, f uh, this is not the place where you will put your uh, number, this will be a place where you will find another hash function which when you apply to the key, right, uh, will give you the location of uh, this uh, uh, key in the secondary hash table. So to just let me go first quickly all the way to the end just to show you. So the strategy is this. You will have this hash table will be two layered hash table. The first one will be of size linear in M, right? And if you have a key X, uh, you find uh, uh, its slot IX, and in that slot you will find a hash function, right? And when you apply this hash function to uh, X, it will bring you to a slot where X sits, and of course the record associated with the key so each slot in this uh, primary hash table will contain a hash function, uh, sorry, uh, another hash function, right? So you will have linearly many um, in N uh, auxiliary hash tables, right? Each table kind of resolving the conflicts of the, that would be, that would occur in if you use uh, the primary hash table to actually uh, put the, the key inside here, right? So to avoid collisions, 
you will have another hash functions that all the collisions will be sent to different slots uh, in an auxiliary corresponding uh, uh, hash table. So how do we do that? Uh, we do that, uh, where are we? Okay, so um, you see, now the trick is if you have, say, ni collisions in the primary hash table, if in the primary hash table, if in i slot there would be ni collisions, we just saw how to design a secondary hash table that is size quadratic in the number of collisions in that slot, which is completely hash free. So the size of the secondary hash table is allowed to be quadratic in the number of elements. But number of elements will be the, collision, the elements that all went into the same slot, right? And presumably there will be few of them, so ni will be small, and we only have to guarantee that some of the sizes of all secondary hash tables will remain linear in n rather than quadratic, right? So uh, once again, in, the, in this picture, these guys are quadratic in the number of elements that would be placed in this hash table if you used it directly to, put ele to store elements here, right? So these hash tables, secondary hash tables, will be quadratic in the number of elements that would go to this slot. But because there will be few collisions per slot, even though this is quadratic, some total of all these squares will be still linear in n. That's the, that's the trick. So let's see uh, how, this is, uh, uh, how this is done. Okay, so let us see first uh, how many collisions there are in the i slot. Well, if you have ni many elements, there are ni over too many pairs, uh, which is equal to this ni times ni minus 1 divided by 2, and you can now split the two terms. You get ni squared divided by 2 minus ni divided by 2. Now, uh, ni is the number of elements in the i slot. So if you sum up this, this sum of the squares of the number of elements in each slot, this will amount to summing up these guys. Right, so if I multiply both sides of this equation by two, I get that sum that uh, ni squared is equal two times this binomial coefficient plus ni. So if I sum up, I will get two times sum of all these binomial coefficients plus sum of all ni's, but uh, Ni is number of element in i slot, so this sum here is just n, right? So we get that sum of the squares are twice the sum of these binomial coefficients plus n. But what is this? Well, this is just the sum, total number of collisions in the table, right? Because it's a sum of number of collisions in each slot, right? So uh, there are altogether n over two pairs of keys, right? And uh, because we use universal hashing uh, to generate the table, probability of a collision for any pair is one over m. So the expected total number of collisions is number of pairs times one over m, right? So what do we get then? Uh, we get that uh, the expected value of uh, this sum is equal to, because this is sum a total of uh, collisions uh, in each slot, so it's sum total of the collisions. It's uh, n over 2 divided by uh, m, which is n, n minus 2 divided by 2m, right? So this is uh, this. So, but remember we chose m to be between n and 2n, right? It's a prime larger than n and smaller than 
n. So if you substitute this here, you get the expected value of the sum of the squares uh, is uh, I replace capital N by small n and I get something larger, right? Plus n, and lo and behold, when you sum up this, you get 2n minus 1, which is smaller than 2n. So some total of the squares, uh, the uh, squares of the sizes of the auxiliary hash tables, right? Because we pick size of each hash table to be a number uh, smaller than twice this number, right? Because it's a prime smaller than the number of elements to be hashed, right? So what do you get? Um, right, uh, you get that uh, uh, probability. Now we use Markov inequality. We know the expected value of the sum of the squares, right? It's smaller than 2n. And now we are asking what's the probability that the, this sum of the squares will be larger, be, will be larger than 4n. Why 4n? Well, you will see in a moment uh, that uh, um, uh, 4 is simply chosen because we got that the expected value of the sum of the squares of uh, number of elements in each slot is smaller than, the top is smaller than 2n, and we chose 4n for the bound, so this is, you get that probability that sum of the squares will be larger than 4n is smaller than 1 half. Right? But sizes of the hash tables, uh, auxiliary hash tables, right, they're all smaller than 2n squared, right? So what do you get? Uh, you get that the sum total of the size of the uh, all tables uh, will be smaller than 8n, right, because uh, um, the size of hash table is uh, smaller than 2n squared, uh, and some total is bigger than 4n. If you multiply by 2, this will be that the probability that you exceed uh, uh, in s that the sum total of the sizes of all hash tables are smaller than 8n is less than 1 half. Uh, right? So what does this mean? Uh, this means that some total of sizes of both auxiliary, all auxiliary hash tables, plus the primary hash table, you remember m is smaller than 2n, is smaller than 2n plus 8n, which is 10n. So uh, with large probability, you will obtain a, a hash table so that with probability uh, uh, larger than one half, you will obtain a hash table that has the property that some total of all of its size and some total of all auxiliary um, hash tables for each slot is uh, um, uh, less than 10n, right? So how do we then build the, the uh, how do we build such a hash table? You simply start with choosing an M that is a prime that is between N and 2N, right? You use universal hashing to pick a random vector and you hash all of your keys into the hash table. Then you count the number of collisions the number of elements ni in each slot of the hash table, you find the sum of the squares of these numbers, and you check whether the sum of squares is smaller than 4n or larger than 4n. With probability one half, probability that you get a number smaller than 4n is bigger than one half, right? So with just a few, namely on average just two trials, you will generate a primary uh, hash table, right? 
that has the property that sum of the squares of the number of elements in each slot is less than 4n. Then what you do, so you use a random process, trial and error, to generate the primary uh, table. Now what you do, for each ni, right, you use secondary, you again randomly choose a, a hash table of size m that is uh, smallest prime larger than ni squared, right? And we saw that for each slot, probability uh, that uh, the corresponding hash table uh, of size um, less than 2ni two, uh, two squared uh, is uh, totally collision free, is smaller, is larger than 1 half. So with probability 1 half for each slot, you will get a completely collision free table. If the table is not collision free, you throw it out, you randomly choose a new vector, you try it again. On average, for each slot, you will do about two trials on average before finding a perfectly collision free hash table of that size. You go to the next slot, Again, you randomly choose uh, the hash function for a table of size uh, prime number that is uh, smaller than uh, uh, 2 and 2 squared, right? And you repeat this random building for all of the slots, uh, right? And eventually you end up with uh, all hash tables be being perfectly collision free, right? And voila, what you get is a two-layer um, hash function that is actually extremely fast, right? Because how does the hash function operate now? Uh, primary hash function, in the, when you hash the element, in that slot, you will find the particular successful value of the random vector. For the secondary hash table, so you simply evaluate two um, scalar products divided, modded out by m, right? And uh, in fact, uh, n i's will be very small because, right, there are the, due to universal hashing, there will be few collisions per slot. So this will be tiny little uh, uh, hash tables, right? So. Um, in this way, uh, you, uh, so you first find the random vector for the secondary hash table. You use that random vector to compute the index of the slot uh, in the secondary hash table. And this is where you store your, uh, your key. So it looks a little bit convoluted, but actually it can be ex implemented uh, in an extremely efficient way, and it's a guarantee that such a static table will be uh, extremely fast to use, uh, right? And it's kind of tables that are used in, uh, uh, for compilers and for all the sorts of applications when uh, uh, you need uh, static uh, collision-free uh, hash tables, uh, right? So please uh, read the slides at home. It's kind of, it's not a rocket science, but there is a lot going, uh, uh, going through. And pay a special attention on how Markov inequality is used. We will use it many times uh, to estimate the probability that the random variable achieves large values uh, from the size of this large value and the expected value of the uh, random variable. Okay, so we will have a midterm, right? On the midterm, you will get something that tests of your very basic understanding of randomized algorithms and the problems will have A and B in which A will be a pretty clear clue how to get the B part. 
So for as long as you understand uh, uh, the basics of probability and how it is used in algorithm design, uh, it will be easy. So the, uh, the midterm will be uh, the first week after the break, and you will have on Monday the regular part, uh, and then you will have a short midterm uh, on Tuesday when you will get maybe just two problems uh, uh, to solve regarding the extended material. So just make sure you yes. Yeah, I'll uh, uh, I'll try to find past uh, examples and. Uh, uh, send you for you to practice, yeah.